to Cornerstone. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Please stand and join us. Father, before we open our Bibles and search for you in the Scriptures, we, we humble our hearts and we open our minds to receive all that you have for us. God, you are infinitely big. Your ways are unsearchable. And this morning, we invite you to take us on a journey that we would know even more about you, that our faith would increase as we see just how immense you are, just how far beyond our understanding, your presence goes. Father, you're a mighty God, and you lead us into victory. You call us to do the work of your kingdom. So prepare our hearts to receive your word. We love you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Cornerstone, I uh, will point you in the direction of Exodus chapter 3 as we continue our new series, Journey to the Promised Land. And as you're turning there, I want to talk to you a little bit about the activity that consumed most of my childhood, all right? I don't know how many are going to be able to relate to this, but I grew up on a farm. Uh, Next to me was a pond, and about a mile and a half away down an old dirt road was a a creek. And every chance that I got, I was uh, at a pond or a creek on a Saturday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning catching everything that I could, putting it in buckets, uh, fishing, 
I just loved the water. And I, and I remember uh, one of my favorite things to do would be go, to, to go up and down that creek bed, and I had this clear plastic bucket. So I'd, I'd scoop up that cold, clear water, and I'd, I'd set it somewhere where I could see inside, and I'd start turning the rocks over. And I'd catch a crayfish here and a little minnow over there and a, a tadpole and a water bug and a snail, and I'd start putting everything in the bucket. And I'd fill that bucket up, and then I would go up to it, and I would, I would observe for a while. I would look inside and, and see how these animals were interacting with one another. And I would watch them very closely. And I'd, I'd watch a crayfish, and uh, I'd see these little feathers on its, uh, on its tail begin to push water over its lungs. Uh, or I might observe it even closer and see that another crayfish had some eggs tucked up uh, under its tail. Or I'd look at a tadpole, and I'd see these teeny tiny legs sticking out the back next to its tail or in some cases I could remember the the front arms hadn't poked through the skin yet but you could see it pressing against the skin all these incredible things that I knew what these little creatures were but if you closely observed them it just seemed like you could learn so much and I was fascinated by it I would do it all the time I remember all the way until I was a senior in high school, I wanted to be a marine biologist because I was so fascinated with water life. But uh, as God began to change my heart for reasons I didn't understand at the time, I loved people more than I liked animals. And I thought, if I'm a marine biologist, I'm not going to get to interact with people like I want to. So I dropped that and, and started going for physical therapy instead because I wanted to work with people. Uh, but I, I, it, that passion has remained in me, that hobby, that interest. I'm always fascinated by the water. If I'm going to relax, I go to the water. I just love the water. Well, well today, this morning, what I want to do is I want to take something that we kind of already know about. We've got kind of a, a good picture of how God works in our minds and who He is and how He's revealed Himself. But every once in a while, we want to take a closer look and, and really see some things that maybe we haven't taken time uh, to search out in the past uh, and and we, we remember that God is just infinite. He's unsearchable. There's always more and more to learn about him. So we never want to get him boxed up somewhere nice and comfy and, and forget that he can so quickly blow out of those preconceived notions that we have, that this is how God works, this is who he is. Uh, we, want, we want to give him some time this morning as we search the word to stretch his wings a little. So in, uh, so in Exodus chapter 3, we're going to take that journey here today. Uh, and I, I want to remind you quickly where we were at in chapters cha uh, in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. By the way, I will probably get tongue-tied this morning because my wife has been over with the, uh, uh, the kids in the cabin fever getaway since yesterday. And I have three kids that I took care of last night and this morning. And uh, I'm just glad to be standing here and not holding a cup of coffee between points in this message. So bear with me. We'll do this together. Chapters 1 and 2 was about the oppression and severe bondage of Israel. Okay, We, we, we spent the first couple of chapters last, last week looking at just how terrible the situation was. And, and we saw how God is beginning to uh, lay out a plan. He delivered Moses as an infant. And, and he, he, he's preparing him uh, to be a servant now. And in chapter 3, everything's about to change. Because now God is going to reveal himself. God is getting ready to move. And this is going to be exciting. As God ruffles his feathers a little bit and says, I'm, I'm ready to let the nation see my glory. I'm ready to deliver my people. We're going to go on that journey with him. And I just want to take a, a kind of a time out this morning. Uh, because most, most people, as they're going to break down Exodus chapters 3 and 4, it's all about the call of Moses. And we're going to spend some time on that next week. But this week, I don't want to miss the revelation of God in chapter 3. So I'm going to be very selective in what I pull out to look at today because we're going to cover more of this next Sunday. Today, we're just going to take these glimpses of God, and we're going to take five glimpses, five different ways that he re reveals himself, and uh, we're, we're just going to dig into those. Probably going to go a little deeper than I typically do on a Sunday morning in some areas, but hang with me. It's worth it. You're going to find some really neat stuff out here this morning that I think will push you to further study. So you're going to definitely want to take notes this morning. If you have a pen, there's a little note section in the back of your worship folder. Uh, and definitely open your Bibles because 
Uh, there's, there's a lot of connections that we're going to do uh, to, to kind of pull this out here this morning. So our first glimpse of God is going to be right off the bat in the first six verses. We're going to get a glimpse of the angel of the Lord. So the angel of God is that first glimpse we're going to see. Let me begin by reading the first six verses of Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And here it is, you might mark this in your Bible, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Circle that angel of the Lord because we're going to investigate that. He appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Verse 5, then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I'm going to pause right there because I want you to take note, church. God's first words to Moses were an announcement of his holiness. Okay, the very first thing before he does anything with Moses is he says, whoa, stop, take off your sandals, which is a sign of respect. You are in the presence of a holy God. You are on holy ground. Verse six, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Okay, so here's here's our first glimpse that I, I want us to picture. This is a very familiar story. I, I, would, I would be surprised that if you have never heard of Moses in the burning, in the burning bush. And I, and I want you to picture what, what comes to mind when you hear that. Moses in the burning bush, what are you envisioning? Uh, it might be shaped by stories you learned in Sunday school or movies that you've watched on TV, posters or pictures that you've seen. But what do you see? Typically when I see this scene, I see Moses and a burning bush. All right, you, you with me? So far, this isn't hard. But there's something, I, I wonder if there's a few of you who really know this passage well who have another character in that scene. The angel of the Lord is in the fire of the burning bush, and Moses sees him. All right, oftentimes we forget that. We're not picturing that. We just see Moses in the bush. But right off the bat, verse 2 the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire. Out of the midst of the bush. Okay, now we're, we're going to start off running here, okay? I'm going to connect a bunch of dots for you. My, my girls, they love the connect the, dot, the, the connect the dot activities. So you look at the page, there's a bunch of dots everywhere. It looks like nothing, right? And then you start, if you, if you do it in order the way you're supposed to, it starts to make a picture. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I've got a bunch of verses here. I don't typically go all over the place like this, so bear with me this morning. But we're going to take a bunch of scattered scriptures, connect the dots, and I, I want you to see a picture of God, perhaps in a way that you've never seen him before. And it all begins with this revelation of the angel of the Lord to Moses. So I'm going to back up to Genesis chapter 22 when the angel of the Lord appeared to someone else, Abraham. So write, write these scripture references down uh, or follow me in your Bible. Genesis chapter 22, because you're going to want to study this a little bit later if this piques your curiosity. So let me read from Genesis 22, verse 10. Then Abraham reached out of his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. This is another familiar scene. Are you with me? This is Abraham getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac at the command of the Lord. And again, in verse 11, here he comes. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withhold your son, your only son, from me. Now the first thing I want to start to point out, and we're going to see this everywhere, are these blurred lines between the angel of, of the Lord and God himself. Notice what the angel says. I see that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me, an interesting thing for the angel to say. Verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And we know the story. He looked over, he took the ram, he sacrificed it instead of his son Isaac, and then he called that place Jehovah Jireh, the, the Lord will provide. 
uh, because the Lord provided him a, a sacrifice instead of his son. Verse 15, we pick the story back up. Here he is again. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sand that is on the seashore. This is the angel of the Lord speaking. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now, it, it seems here as the angel of the Lord is not really distinguishing himself uh, from the Lord. And, and, and this could be because he is a, a, a spokesman for God. Uh, we, we know that uh, even the word angel just means messenger, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It just means messenger. So that's, that's, that's the capacity that Abraham meets this angel, speaking the Lord's will to him. Well, the angel of the Lord appears to another familiar character, uh, the, the, the descendant of Abraham. Jacob encounters this angel. Genesis chapter 32. And I'll read from verses 24 to 30. Another interesting conversation. And another story you've probably heard. And Jacob, in verse 24, was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. This is where Jacob is wrestling the man and asking for a blessing. Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So they continue wrestling Jacob and this man. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Verse 28, then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So this man who's wrestling Jacob changes his name from Jacob to Israel. Why? And then, and then Jacob asks him his name. Verse 29, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Well, this man did not tell Jacob what his name was, but it appears Jacob has a guess. Okay, He says, I have seen God, and that's Elohim in the Hebrew, I have seen God face to face, and my life has been delivered because uh, the Israelites believed to see God face to face meant that you would die. No man can see the face of God and live. Uh, so, so he is feeling grateful that he has striven with this man uh, in, who is, he now believes was God himself and does not die. Now, Hosea the prophet has a comment on this, so I'm going to turn there very quickly. You might just write this in your margin, Hosea 11, 3 through 4. This is what Hosea says. The Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob for his way. So this is way down later in history. This is talking about the tribes of Jacob. He will pay according to his deeds. Verse 3, in the womb he took his brother by the heel. Now he's talking about Jacob as a person. And in his manhood he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. Here Hosea is using the, the words angel and God interchangeably. And uh, we, we, just, we, we, we see this uh, even in Jacob's blessing. As Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph, I want you to see how he uses interchangeably the angel of the Lord and God himself. This is in Genesis 48. You can write these passages down if you can't turn there, uh, but I have to keep moving for time's sake. Genesis 48. Verse 14, and Israel stretched out his right hand. Now remember, Israel is Jacob. He just had his name changed to Israel when he wrestled with God. And he laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, uh, for Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said. Now remember, he's blessing Joseph by blessing his sons. We talked about the tribes last week. So Ephraim and Manasseh are the sons of Joseph. And Israel, or Jacob, is blessing them. And this is what his blessing says. The God, Elohim, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God, Elohim, who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel 
who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And he continues his blessing. So it was in the name of God, Elohim twice, and then the angel he used interchangeably in there. And, and even, even spoke of things that only God can do. The angel who has redeemed me, that's a work of God, from all evil. Bless the boys. Well, that's, that's interesting. Because the line just continues to blur between God and the angel of the Lord. God tells Moses that his very name, Yahweh, is in this angel in Exodus chapter 23. Let's turn there quickly. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves in Exodus, but we need to follow the trail of this angel to connect some dots. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him for he will not pardon your transgression for my name is in him but if you carefully obey his voice and do all that i say then i will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary this is this is a key passage cornerstone so if i'm drowning you right now just just come up for a breath because we need to remember that God sent his angel to lead them from captivity in Egypt to the possession of the promised land. This angel was a, a, a literal figure that came down and led them to the land. And he is doing things, again, that only God can do. He is, uh, he is pardoning or not pardoning transgressions. And God says he places his name in this angel. Uh, the I am of the burning bush uh, is going to be with his people on this journey with them to the promised land in the form of an angel. And, and I'll even point out a couple other passages, and then we'll stop this, all right? Uh, uh, you can chase down some of these for future study. L let's see what Judges chapter 2, verse 1 says about this journey that the angel took them on. And, and as, as you're writing that down, Judges chapter 2, here's, here's what I want to say about this particular passage. If we looked at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, we would read that it was the angel of the Lord that took the people of God to the promised land from Egypt. We could look at the same passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 35. It tells us about how the angel, how the, how the Lord, I'm sorry, not the angel of the Lord, the Lord took them from Egypt to the promised land. Same thing in Joshua 24. It was Yahweh who took them and delivered them from Egypt and took them to the promised land. And then Judges, most likely written by Samuel, says this. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. This is the angel of the Lord speaking. Uh, this, this angel seems to speak with the mind and the authority of God himself. I'm going to take you to one last conversation between a judge named Gideon and the angel of the Lord. And it's, it's a bizarre conversation. You can barely keep up with what's happening. Who's Gideon talking to? And what form is, is it taking place? And this is going to be in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11. Listen to Gideon's encounter with the angel of the Lord. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth. A lot of translations just call that an oak tree. At Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide, it, to hide from the Midianites. Okay, So the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon as he's hiding from the Midianites. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. There's a point I'd like to make here. This man, this angel of the Lord that appears to Gideon, does not seem to have some type of divine, intimidating countenance. In other words, when he appears to Gideon, we don't see Gideon falling on his face trying to worship this thing because it's, uh, it's otherworldly. He talks to him just like another man. And as the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, 
He says, hey, the Lord is with you. I don't think Gideon recognizes that this is a representative of the Lord because he says, he's with us. Have you looked around? We're being oppressed by the Midianites. I'm not hiding in this little cellar for no reason. The Lord isn't with us. He's abandoned us. This is the conversation Gideon is having with the angel of the Lord. I say that to say, I don't think the angel of the Lord has giant wings and is glowing and looks something. He looks like a normal man. Gideon doesn't see him as anything other than a normal man. Verse 14. Now, we've been saying that the, Lord is, uh, the angel of the Lord is speaking to Gideon. Uh, it is the angel of the Lord that sat under the terebinth. It's the angel of the Lord that appeared to him. Now in verse 14, we've lost the angel of the Lord. And the Lord turned to him and said, and by the way, that's, that, that, that Lord is Yahweh in, in Hebrew. So it, it can't be anything else. This is Yahweh. The, the Lord, Yahweh, turned to him and said, Go in his might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord. And that, Now that's just Adonai. That's just a, a normal sign of uh, respect. How can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And again in verse 16, The Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here till I come and bring you out of my present uh, and set it before you. And he said, I will stay to your return. I, all right, let's catch up. What just happened here? Gideon's talking to this man, and this, man's, this man is speaking with the authority of God. And now this man tells Gideon, I will send you by my power to deliver the Israelites from Midian. And Gideon steps back and he says, who am I talking to right now? There is something very strange about this man. You're talking with the authority of God. And in the passage itself, it's the angel of the Lord twice and the Lord twice, Yahweh. So Gideon says, hold up, hold up. Can you do me a favor? Before you leave this spot, I'm going to run and I'm, I'm going to prepare you something. And I want you to give me a sign that you are who I think you are. Are you following me? Okay, so this is what happens. Verse 19. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he placed in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth or the oak tree and presented them. Now we're back to this. The angel of God said to him, take the meat. Verse 20 I'm in. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. He's following instructions. Then in verse 21, the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff and th that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. All right, if Gideon was looking for a sign, as old Jeff Foxworthy would say, <laughs> right? There's your sign. It just happened. This, this angel of the Lord, he touches this man, the, he touches with the end of his staff this meal that, that um, Gideon had just poured broth all over, and poof, it's gone in a burst of flames, and the man is gone. That's a pretty good sign that Gideon's gut was telling him this was a little something different going on here. But then it gets stranger, Cornerstone, because the angel of the Lord is gone. That's who Gideon's been talking with this whole time. Verse 22, he keeps talking. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And we know why he's scared, because to see the face of the Lord means death. But the Lord said to him, in verse 23, the angel's gone. The Lord said to him, they're still talking, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace, Jehovah Shalom. That's where the name, the context of Jehovah Shalom comes from. And to this day, it still stands. Well, now that's just fascinating. That, that makes me scratch my head just a little bit. What just happened? Who was there? One man or two? How many voices? Who was Gideon hearing from? Was the angel talking? Was it God? Was it both? Where's the lines of distinction in this story? It appears to me that over and over, those lines of distinction are withdrawn. They're not there. It's purposeful. There's just this blur. 
between the angel of the Lord and Yahweh himself. We'll come back to this a little bit later, but I will say this. It is my understanding, Cornerstone, that the angel of the Lord was Yahweh's visible manifestation in the Old Testament. Okay, do you follow me? When Yahweh wanted to appear to a a person in this world face to face in physical form, it was the angel of the Lord that took that presence, that took that shape. And sometimes it was an angel in the midst of a fire of a burning bush. Other times it was a man that wrestled like with Jacob. Other times it was a man who stood before Gideon. But all of them spoke with the authority and the power of Yahweh himself. And at times in those conversations, it's almost impossible to tell who's talking, the angel of the Lord or Yahweh himself. So I believe because of that, that was Yahweh's visible uh, um, presentation, his manifestation. Anyhow, this is, I gave you all those scripture references because you don't got to take my word for that. You can go do some more study. We don't have time to keep digging into this thing. But it's just a little glimpse of God for us to say that, you know what? Man, sometimes there's more to God than my brain can wrap around. And he's just an amazing God. Let's look at glimpse number two, the presence of God. Let's get back into our text here in Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to read from 7 to 12. And and we're going to see the presence of God as a a characteristic of God here. Just another glimpse of him. Then the Lord said in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I'm about to read verse 8, which is the key verse of Exodus. You might mark that. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to do good and broad, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is God's game plan given to Moses. This is what I'm up to, Moses. I'm going to take these people from Egypt. I'm going to deliver them to a good land filled with milk and honey, the promised land. So why the key to Exodus is deliverance, the theme is worship. There's a difference. Okay? The, the whole point here is not deliverance. The point is that they are, de- they are delivered to do something, to worship God. They were in bondage. They were in servitude. Now they're being delivered by Yahweh Himself for the purpose of going into a land that He has prepared for them and worshiping God as their God. And that's the theme of Exodus. Let's continue in verse 9. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with, with, the, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. You might underline that. I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Okay, glimpse number two is God's presence. I will be with you. I think we have heard those words somewhere before, have we not, church? I think just a a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, and 20, in verse 20, Jesus told us, I will be with you. This is a characteristic of God with His covenant people. He is with them. He is not a distant God. He is not a cosmic God. He is with His people. I will be with you. Now, it, this is interesting for poor Moses because if we just think of the last two chapters, the last time he tried to do something about the oppression of his people, he ended up messing up really bad and he got exiled from it. So when God's telling him he's the great deliverer, I know Moses is thinking, God, That's not my specialty. (laughs) Tried that, done that before. It did not turn out well. But God assures Moses of his presence. I, Moses, will be with you. See, before you tried this, and you did it in your own time, you tried it in your own way, and you did it under your own power, and it didn't turn out very good. I understand that. But this time, I'm with you. And that makes all the difference in the world. You know, I, I, I think we need to understand how important this is. This marked Moses' ministry from that point on. In fact, if we went to Exodus chapter 33, we would hear Moses pleading with, with God saying, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. 
He says, if I have not found favor in your sight, I and your people, if, if we are not distinct from everyone else, don't send us up from here if your presence will not go with us. And he says, what else will separate us uh, from the rest of the people on the face of the earth? Is it not your presence that makes us distinct? Moses gets it. With God's presence, they are victorious. Without God, bad stuff happens. That's the story of Moses' life. So Moses becomes a leader who refuses to move unless the presence of God goes with him. <laughs> oh, oh, that Christians today could get that lesson. It, God simply says, you want to know about me? I'm a God whose presence goes with his people. People, don't go outside of the presence of God. That's not where victory lies. We stay in step with the Holy Spirit, we are instructed. We stay within the boundaries that God has given to us. With Israel, he set up literal physical boundaries and laws to protect them. With New Testament Christians, we are given uh, the law of Christ that is there to protect us. If we step outside those borders, people, we're outside the presence of God. And it's not going to turn out well. Don't deceive yourselves into thinking, it'll turn out right for me. God says to stay in these lines, but if I go out here, I've got plan B, and it's going to work out great. It never works out great. There's always a price to pay when God's people try to get outside of the presence of God. But there's always victory to be claimed. God gives us that promise. He will always lead us in victory in Christ. Always. But we've got to stay in Christ. We've got to stay within those borders. Moses gets it. He will not leave. God says, I want you to go into the promised land. And, and Moses turns back and says, you're coming, right? Because if you don't go into the promised land, I'm not interested in the promised land. I'd rather stay in the wilderness with you. That is to be the heart of the people of God. Let's move on to the next glimpse. The name of God. Now this one's fascinating as well. Verses 13 through 16, God is going to reveal his personal name to Moses. Let's begin. Verse 13, Exodus 3, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Circle that word, I am. I am has sent me to you. To you. In fact, that's, that's the name that you see right up here on the screen. That's God's name. yod Hey vav Hey in the original Hebrew. I am. God also said to Moses in verse 15, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is God's eternal name. This isn't just necessarily a characteristic of God. This is who God is. This is like me saying, my name is John. It's extremely personal. It, it, this, is, this is God's literal name that he is revealing to Moses. You want to know who sends you to, uh, to, to take this task to the people? Tell them that I am, the great I am sends you. They'll know who you're talking about. Verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. God gives Moses a message here. Now this, this name actually has a meaning to it. Uh, I am means self-existent. A part of all, uh, apart from all things existed. Th this, is what, th this is one of the things that sets God apart from all. All other things is that he is eternal. He is not created. He exists independently from everything else. There is nothing that contributes to his existence. That's all wrapped up in this name, I am. I am. Everything outside of God is there because of God's creative power. Now, there's a lot there that I think we don't know about. But whether it's an angel, whether it's a human, whether it's a fish in the sea, or whether it's a, 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 a ruler or an authority or a cosmic power over the present darkness uh, or a force of spiritual evil in the, in the heavenly realms, as Ephesians 6 verse 12 puts it, whether you're any of those things, it doesn't matter. You are apart from God and part of his creation. There's Yahweh and there's everything else. There's the great I am and there's those things that are here because the great I am exists. Take that name out of the equation and nothing exists. Everything exists because and through and for that name, I am. 
four-letter word. It's, a, it's called the tetragrammatron, those four little letters. And there's something interesting here because those four letters are all consonants. So we really don't know exactly how to pronounce that. The, the vowels were added to the Hebrew language much later. So that's our best guess. We took the, the vowels out of Adonai and dropped them in there, and that's what makes Yahweh. So it could be a combination of different sounds. We don't know exactly what the vowels are. Just do me this favor. I had one Sunday school leader, uh, teacher, who always tripped over the name Yahweh when he saw it written out, and he would always pronounce it Yahoo. And I would always say, don't pronounce it like that, please. But he could never fix it. Every time he saw that, he would pronounce it Yahoo. Uh, but we don't know exactly how it is pronounced, but Yahweh is our best guess. Now, the English way to pronounce that, anybody know? Jehovah. Jehovah, that's the English pronunciation. So you can say Yahweh, which is God's literal name in Hebrew, or if you wanted to uh, say it in our language, it would be Jehovah. Just like we call Jesus, Jesus, we don't call him Joshua, but his name was actually Joshua in the Greek, but Jesus is that uh, that translation coming over. So we have uh, Yahweh being introduced here to Abraham, I am. And I'm going to give you just a quick couple tips here. There's some interesting things that our translators have done in the Bible to help you understand exactly what you're looking at when you, when you look at the names of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. For example, whenever you see Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's that right there. Yahweh, when they're all capitals. When you see capital L, lowercase o-r-d, that's Adonai. And those two combinations take up the majority of uses in the Old Testament, but there are uh, lots of other ones. But Adonai, when it's capital L, and when they're all caps, you know you're looking at the personal name, I am, Yahweh. If you see God with just a capital G, that's Elohim. That's a generic term for God, but that's all used throughout the Old Testament. Uh, if you see Lord God with all capital G-O-D, uh, Lord God is uh, Adonai Yahweh. Uh, and these are, these are put in there uh, all through the Old Testament, and they're, they're spelled certain ways and with, uh, so that we can understand what we're looking at. If, when you see Lord of hosts, that's Jehovah Saba, the warrior of God. Uh, God Almighty, that's El Shaddai. Whenever you see these types of words in the Old Testament, that's our translators trying to help us out because there's so many names of God and they're trying to preserve it instead of just saying God every time. They're showing them in different ways so that we can grab a little of that and understand that. The New Testament is, is much, much more easy. You have God, which is Theos, and, and you have Lord, which is Kyrios, which is the Old Testament form of Adonai. So the, the New Testament makes things much, much more simple. But that's, that's, uh, that's just for you as you're, you're reading through your Bible, as you see the different forms of, uh, of God written down. It's your translators working with you, trying to help you understand what it is that you're reading. All right, let's move on to the next glimpse of God. Glimpse number four, the omniscience of God. Omniscience, knowing all things. Verse 17 through 22. Listen to the Lord tell Moses, I've got a plan, and I know exactly how it's going to work out. Listen. Verse 17, And I promise that I will bring you out of the land of the affliction of Egypt in the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. God says, uh, Moses, I know that I'm going to deliver uh, Israel. Israel is going to be delivered. Know that, Moses. Verse 18, and they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey to the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So they, they, the second thing God says to Moses is, Look, they're going to listen to you. They're going to follow you. I'm going to deliver the, the, the Hebrews from the land of Egypt, and you, they are going to listen to you, Moses. You can be sure of this. Uh, verse 19 but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So God's telling Moses, listen, I know that, that Pharaoh's not going to listen to you without some compelling reasons. I get that. So he says in verse 20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So I will demonstrate my power. And after that, Pharaoh will let you go, Moses. I know it to be so. Verse 20, I will stretch out my hand, strike Egypt with the wonders and the power that I will do with it, and I will give to this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. When you go, you shall not go empty. Verse 22, each woman 
shall ask her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold, jewelry and clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. When they left, they would plunge, they would they would plunder the uh, Egyptians, but not out of force, out of favor. God says, I will cause their hearts to favor you, and when you leave, you'll be asking for things, and they're going to give you gold and silver and jewelry and clothing, and you're going to leave that land with all their wealth. God says, I, I know that this will happen. Now, any time that God shows his omniscience, how much he knows, I want you to know this, church. He's doing it for a reason. He's showing off his power, Okay. Uh, there's this really cool scene, and this, this one's for the guys, all right? You guys get a story this morning. Do you remember the movie True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger? I used to love watching movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is when I was going to college, and in True Lies, Arnold, I can't even remember the character's name, so we're just going with Arnold. Arnold was just Mr. Dad at home, just a, a normal guy that had an office job, but when he went to work, he was actually an undercover agent on the front lines beating down the bad guys, right? So one day, Arnold finds himself in a terrible predicament. He's been captured, he's been handcuffed to a chair, and they're going to extract some information out of him. So they've given him a truth serum, which movies always come up with that, right? You just inject that into your blood, and now you can tell nothing but truth. He got some of that, and the, uh, he had an executioner in the room with him. And there's knives and real nasty-looking instruments. And, and you can see as the scene unfolds, they're going to get Mr. Arnold to talk. So as he gives him the truth serum, he walks over and he asks him a question. And, and Arnold says, I'm going to kill you, just matter-of-factly. And it piques the guy's interest because he says, well, you had a truth serum. So he says, oh, okay, how are you going to do that? Of course, he's very... Uh, sure that that's not going to happen because he's tied to a chair. And he says, well, first I'm going to take you and use you as a shield, and then I'm going to grab that knife and kill that guard over there, and then I'm going to kill you. And he says, okay. I could show the scene, but it's probably not appropriate here for church this morning. <laughs> so then he says, well, okay. Well, how are you going to do that? Again, not barely even paying attention to Arnold. He's just making conversation as he's getting his instruments ready. And then Arnold pulls his hands in front of the chair, and he says, the handcuffs that you put me, that you put me in, I've picked the lock. And then the guy looks at him with wide eyes, and Arnold grabs him, uses him as a shield, takes a knife, throws, kills the guard, and then kills him and walks out of there, just like he said he was going to do. And you're left thinking, man, that guy is awesome. He knew exactly what he was going to do, and he did it. That's exactly what God is doing here, okay? He looks at Moses, and he says, Egypt, Pharaoh, I'm not intimidated. We're going to go to Pharaoh. We're going to tell him exactly how we're going to leave. There's nothing he can do about it. And when we leave, we're taking all their possessions. And it's exactly what happened. It's, it's a way of saying, I am strong enough that I can look my enemy in the eye, tell them exactly what I'm going to do, and there's nothing you can do about it because I am far too powerful for you to suppress. That's what God does here with his omniscience. And he tells this to Moses to give him confidence in the plan that, that God is putting out before him. I'm, we're going to do this, Moses, and this is exactly how it's going to work. All right. Well, that's all I have from True Lies. We're going to get back into the scripture here. <laughs> Final glimpse. And this is the exciting one, church. Anytime we see God revealing himself in the Old Testament without fail, scripture is so meticulous, it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus will manifest these traits that we have seen in God in the New Testament. And, and some of this, church, is, is blow your socks off kind of stuff. It's really neat. The first place we're going to look at is Jude chapter 1 because it's its only chapter. Go to Jude. It's the book right before Revelation. We're going to look at verse 5, and I'm going to connect for you. If we'll go to our last slide, uh, Jesus and the angel of God. There's a connection here, and I want you to see it. All the way to Jude. Jude, second to last book in your Bible. Jesus and the angel of God. Let's take a look. Now, you know, here's what I want you to notice is when, when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, he mixed them up. He said sometimes uh, it was the angel of God that delivered Israel uh, from A Egypt. Other times he said it was uh, Yahweh. So he mixed the two up. Well, Jude has his own take on this. Jude, verse 5. Now, I want to remind you although you once fully knew it, that Jesus 
who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Wait a minute, who, did, who does Jude say took the people out of the land of Egypt? Jesus. Wow. Well, now there's an interesting connection. Was it Yahweh? Was it the angel of the Lord? Or was it Jesus? Is this a contradiction or is this a combination? Yeah, we know that the Bible does not contradict itself. This is a very fascinating combination. Now, I'll, I'll throw this in there because some of you are looking at your Bible version and you're saying, mine doesn't say Jesus, mine says Lord. How, how come that is? Uh, if, you're, if you're using either the cornerstone Bibles that we use commonly here, the ESV or the NLT, or the New Living Translation, both of them say Jesus, and here's why. It's because of their translating philosophy. The manuscripts that they use are the oldest manuscripts you can find. The oldest manuscripts that we pull Jude from are the, the Vaticus and uh, Alexandrius. It's, it's the farthest back. It's when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they use the words in there, Jesus. Now, before we found those, we used newer versions that we had found, and some of those say Lord in general instead of Jesus. That would include the King James Version, the NASB, the NIV. If you're using any of those versions, it's going to say Lord. But the very earliest versions use the word Jesus. And now we can make the connection with either way we go. But here Jude is looking at this and saying where he saw uh, the angel of the Lord, he also saw Jesus. And, and I want to make this this. I want to point this out to you. Jude, Jude sees this connection. In the Old Testament, the visible manifestation of Yahweh was the angel of the Lord. In the New Testament, the visible manifestation of Yahweh, which went a, a step much farther in the uh, incarnation, was Jesus. But I believe the, the, the way that Jude sees this is that in either case, though they were a little bit different, the angel of the Lord is not the incarnation of God. But in either case, Jude sees the second person of the Trinity being the one that was represented. The one that became the visible manifestation. Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. That would lead me to understand that our understanding of Jesus, this visible manifestation of God in the New Testament, has its roots in the Old Testament. If we had time here this morning, we would look at some of the centuries-old Jewish literature before Jesus even came that had an understanding of the invisible and the visible Yahweh. Fascinating. But when Jesus started to, to make the stretch and say, yeah, that the, the visible manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament that you're so familiar with, that's me. When that happened, all hell broke loose for Jesus between the religious leaders of Israel and himself. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's go there now. I'm going to skip the second one, the uh, presence of God. We'll get there. But let's go straight to the, uh, Jesus in the, uh, the name of God. Uh, turn with me to John chapter 1. This is a familiar passage. While you're turning there, I'm going to read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to point out one quick thing. When Moses was with God, remember when he came down, he was reflecting the glory of God. His face glowed. He covered it with a veil. We'll get there later on in our series. Well, that's not the glory that's, that John 1 is talking about. That was a reflective glory. This glory comes from the inside. This glory was owned by this person who became flesh, and it was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we understand that to be Jesus. When, when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we saw His glory, uh, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Very easy connections for us to make. That is Jesus Christ. But it has Old Testament connections as well. And I want to take you there, just to two of them, just to be quick, but write these down. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. You're going to see here the word of God. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. The word of the Lord first appeared to Abram. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what shall you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Verse 4, Again, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, the number of the stars, if you're able to number them. 
Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Listen to verse 6. And he believed the Lord whom he was speaking to, the word of the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is a big deal because if we connect that to John 1, 1, that means that Abram put his faith in the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God who became flesh as Jesus in the New Testament. The same way we became saved and righteousness was accounted to us by placing faith in Jesus Christ. The Word. It's the Word. Let, let's we'll look at one last passage and I'll stop doing this. I told you we had to connect the dots to do this morning. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you verse 21. First Samuel three twenty one, starting in verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Now listen to this in verse 21. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel as the word of the Lord, which according to John 1.1 is exactly who Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was. It appears to me that this visible manifestation and presence of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament is being done by that second person of the Trinity whom we know by the name of Jesus. Going back to the book of John, here in verse 8. I'm sorry, chapter 8. John chapter 8, because here's where we're going to connect Jesus to the name of God. Now this gets fascinating. In light of all that we've talked about this morning, listen to what Jesus says to the religious leaders in John chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham, Jesus says. He's, He's pointing his finger at these religious leaders. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now that's bizarre because Jesus is arguing with the religious leaders and said, Abraham looked forward to the day he would see me. And when he did, he was happy about it. And of course, the, in verse 57, the, the, the leaders say to Jesus, You're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Do you see what Jesus is doing here? And this is his answer. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I saw Abraham just like Yahweh saw Abraham. When Abraham looked at the angel of Yahweh, he looked into my face. He saw me. Jesus says, I was there. Do do you see the connections just tying together? Jesus couldn't make a more stronger case. The the God that Abraham saw, I'm talking about when God manifested himself to Abraham. He looked forward to that. When he saw it, the word of the Lord, according to Genesis, Jesus says, that was me. That was me. And when he said this, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus himself went out of the temple. You know why they picked up stones to throw at him? That was a claim to of lordship he was claiming to be god when abraham saw yahweh he saw me that's when i saw abraham that's when abraham saw me and they picked up stones to kill him that's blasphemy jesus the incarnate word states that he appeared to abraham prior to the incarnation he was not yet incarnated as jesus christ but he manifested himself isn't this fascinating what a neat study But time limits us, so let me wrap this up. The second uh, glimpse that I didn't connect to Jesus, Jesus was the presence of God, but we've already lightly done that. Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, and 20. God tells us as we are going out and making disciples, He has all the authority. Uh, We are to baptize, to make disciples of all nations, uh, to teach them what He has taught us. And as we do that, He will be with us to the end of the age. The same promise Yahweh gave uh, Moses is exactly repeated word for word to us through Jesus in the Great Commission. I will be with you. Exactly the same wording. Jesus has the the same promise that Yahweh gave, that the presence of God is with us. Finally, our last connection, Jesus and the omniscience of God. I'm going to tie this to uh, John 16, 30. This is why his disciples believed that he was God. Is because he knew all things. John uh, chapter 16, verse 30. Now we know, this is disciples talking. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe 
that you came from God. Jesus possesses this omniscience. In fact, I'll finish with this final verse, Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. Let me read it for you. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. All through the book of John, Jesus walks up to people and he knows them. He calls out Nathan. Nathan says, how do you know me? I saw you under the tree and I knew your heart. Uh, John chapter 2, it says that Jesus knew the hearts of men and he would not commit themselves to him. Jesus could see into the hearts and minds of people and he knew instantly what he was looking at. Was it hypocrisy? Was it rebellion? Was it faith? And he would act on that. And in Revelation, it says that we will meet with Jesus again and he will play the same place. He will look at us and he will open our hearts and he will judge us according to our works. Now, our salvation is by faith alone, by, by, by grace alone through faith. But there will be a day when Jesus looks for the mark of that experience. Just like Moses says, if your presence will not go with us, do not send us up from here. Jesus will look for the presence of God in his followers. Moses said, what else separates us from the rest of people on the face of the earth? Nothing, it's the presence of God. So it is with the followers of Jesus Christ. It is, our, it is the presence of God in our lives that separates us from the rest of the world. It is not our church attendance. It is not our profession of faith. It is not our baptism. It is none of those things. It is the actual living presence of God in our hearts. And that is what Jesus will look for on our day of judgment. Hebrews 9, 27 says it's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment, that judgment will divide our hearts right in half and expose before God whether our names are written in the book of life or not. It is based on whether the presence of God is in our hearts or not. Isn't that marvelous? Jesus wrapped up in all of this in this way. He is our King of kings and Lord of lords that we will answer to. Let me ask you something. If that happened today, if right now Jesus came into this place and made us line up and one by one he looked into our hearts, are you ready for that judgment? Is the presence of God in your heart have you ever come to the cross and asked God to forgive you of your sins and asked Jesus to be the Lord and the King of your life? See, the Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but that is a call that, is, that comes from a broken place in life. It is a call that says, God, I can never get myself to heaven. I am completely uh, incompetent to do this. I need a Savior. Who can do this? And the Scriptures say that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, He will forgive us of our sin. He will wash us clean. We will receive His righteousness. And from that period on, when God looks in our hearts, He sees the righteousness of Christ, the very presence of the Spirit of God resides in us if only we will take Jesus at His word. Have you taken Him at His word? Church, this is serious stuff. This one day will look us face in the face. The, the, the pages of the book will be opened and we will be examined in our heart of hearts to see whether the presence of Christ resides there or not. And our entire eternal future will hinge on that alone. Are you ready? Does the Spirit of God abide in you? Or are you just playing Christian on the outside? That works down here but it won't work in front of Christ. This is our opportunity to make that right now. To live as Moses did when he said, Lord, if you don't go from this place, neither do I. If you go left, I'll go to the left. If you say go straight, I'll go straight. I am your servant. That's what separates me from the rest of the world. Is that what separates you from the rest of the world? I want to give you just a, just, just a minute of silence here today. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. Don't let the silence be awkward. At this time, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And I want you to just make your heart available to God and ask this question from your spirit to his. God, what would you have me to do after what I have heard today? How can I obey you? Let the Lord speak to you. Just, just let's take a few moments of silence. How is the Lord speaking to you? And how will you respond?
God is knocking on your heart's door right now this morning. If he's speaking so clearly to you, you need to do this. You need to surrender your life to me. You need to have your sins forgiven. You need to invite the Spirit of God to dwell in you. If this has not happened in your life, I want you to understand that God is giving you that opportunity this morning. His arms are wide open. He's inviting you into his family. He looks for the humble in spirit who would come to him and say, God, yes, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And when we ask him to do it, he is faithful, he will. With no one looking around right now, if God is speaking in that direction to your heart, if God is, is, is inviting you into his family, if you need to be saved, would you just allow your first step of faith to be an acknowledgement before myself and God? I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you, but would you just place your hand high in the air for me to see? I want to pray for you, not by name. I won't embarrass you. But you need to respond this morning. And it takes courage. No one's looking around. This is your time. Who would place their hand high in the air? Pray for me, Pastor. God's speaking to me this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One placing their hand in the air for me to see this morning, acknowledging their need for Jesus before God. It takes courage. Who else this morning? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Two more acknowledging their need for the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning. Who else? If, if God is speaking to you, thank you, sir. This is no time to sit out on the fence right now. If God is speaking to you, won't you acknowledge before Him, God, I need a Savior this morning. Raise your hand. Ma'am, sir, whoever it is, thank you, sir. Who else this morning? Five raised their hands. Don't you be left out. Who else needs to acknowledge before God? Preacher, pray for me. God is striving with the hearts of His people in here this morning. Do not reject Jesus as your Savior. Who else will place their hand in the air? Pastor, pray for me. God is working in my heart this morning. Thank you, ma'am. Six raising their hand, acknowledging their need. It takes courage. You, you just obey. You leave the consequences up to the Lord. He'll take care of that. Who else this morning? Come on, God is beckoning this morning. If he's touching your heart this morning, don't, don't sit on the fence. Who else would place their hand in the air and say, Pastor, pray for me? Anyone else? You can't imagine how much God desires to reach out to you in this moment. Won't you acknowledge your need for him? Anyone else? Six people have acknowledged their need, and I want to speak to you directly here for a moment. When the King of Kings knocks on your heart's door, you don't send him away. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life, and the very first thing he's going to do, just like God did with Moses, is he's going to reveal his holiness to you. And you might feel a little bit overwhelmed, like you're not good enough, like you're not worthy enough. That's okay. Because where you fall short, Jesus fills in the gaps. And that's what he's asking you to do this morning. As you surrender your life, as you confess to God that you are a sinner, God is ready to wash that away but, and to give you the Savior that can deliver you from your sins that is found in Jesus Christ. Right now, if you are ready to receive him as your Lord and Savior, and that's no small decision, that is the signing away of your life from now to eternity, it no longer belongs to you, it belongs to God. When he says go, you'll go. You're no longer in charge. This isn't some form of easy believism. This is signing your life away. But you are placing your life in the hands of the one who loves you more than anyone else in this universe. If your spirit is in that place right now to receive him as your king, would you just pray from your heart? God listens to the prayer from the heart. Something like this. God, I believe that Jesus Christ died in my place on that cross because I am sinful. And I am asking you right now to wash away my sin, to forgive me. And I thank you for your forgiveness. And in this moment, I reach out by faith and I call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who can save my soul. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life, my King, and my Savior. Change me right where I sit in this moment. 
And from this day forward, I will forever be yours. Amen. With no one looking around, if you're one of those six that raised their hand, would you just kind of look at me right now? No one else is looking around. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just put your hand up in the air, signifying, I just made that commitment in my life. Who else? Who would just thank you, sir? Thank you, ma'am. Two, putting their hands up. Who else? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Four this morning. Five, thank you, ma'am. Who else this morning? Anyone else? I don't want to miss you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Six people. Praise God. Let me pause right here. I want to encourage you. When you make a decision like this, every time Jesus called someone out for his plan and purposes in the New Testament, he called them out publicly. There's no shame in this. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And I told you I wouldn't point you out or embarrass you. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But I'm leaving the decision with you, and I'm inviting you. Would you just step forward? Just come and shake my hand. You don't have to say a word, and and we're going to rejoice as we know what that means, that you have surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and today is a day that has changed you forever, and all the glory goes to God. I want to invite you to do that. Would you just commit in your heart? You're going to be bold and shine for Jesus beginning day one that you cross the line for him. Father, as we get ready to sing here today as a family, you have challenged us with your word. Your spirit is at work in this place, and we thank you. This is part of the journey that you are pulling us toward. And Father, we just surrender our hearts and lives to you. May we live and shine brightly for you, Father. May this be another week that we expand your kingdom, that we tell someone who is lost in darkness and and hopeless about the hope in Jesus Christ. Use us, Father, that we may be bold and filled with your spirit. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his sacrifice for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.